Hi. A couple of months ago, I tweeted this, which was the last tweet in a series where I was playing with a reverse Polish notation compiler that will fit in a tweet. And the end result was 218 bytes. And you can see it here. And if you paste this expression into uh, a web developer console in any browser, then you get back a function that when you call it with a uh, formula in reverse Polish notation, so maybe you have seen languages like Forth, and this is the way you enter them, it will compile it into a WebAssembly module that will export a function called A, that when you call it, it will calculate this and return it as a number. So basically it compiles uh, any mathematical expression or arithmetic expression uh, in the reverse Polish notation into a WebAssembly module that when run, uh, calculates that thing. And here is uh, the code. Let's start trying to explain it by doing some syntax highlighting, but still it's pretty hard to read. The first thing we can do is uh, to format it. So still uh, pretty unreadable, but a uh, big step forward. The first thing to identify is that uh, this function, this anonymous function, doesn't have a body with curly braces. It has uh, a single expression with parentheses using the comma operator. So the comma operator, you may want to check the docs, but uh, it evaluates every single uh, item in the, in the expression separated by commas and return the last one. So that way we avoid uh, the, the return here. So we are saving the return keyword. So the first step is to remove this comma operator and turn this into a body. So now we have the body. And the second thing to notice among many is that we are using a trick where you can have unused function arguments as a shorter way to declare va variables that you are going to use in the body. So here, the function C takes a single argument, which is the, the, the string that contains the, the expression to be parsed and compiled. Uh, and so we add an extra argument into the function just because we want to avoid the let or the var or the const um, keyword and the space that goes after in the body to save some bytes. So we also reuse the S because we get the, the string here. We split it here and compile it in the first line. And after this line, we are no longer using S. So I can reuse it for something else here. And I save uh, either like two or three bytes in the, in the arguments or a variable declaration. So let's undo this. Let's declare our, our variables and stop the variable reuse. So now we only take code, which is the thing we, we were taking anyway. And uh, we use it in the first line, but in the second line, we still have S, but declared here. But still, B and S are not really, uh, really readable. So let's give them proper names. So now we can read that we receive code. And the first variable has the instructions of the expression. And the second line has the, the length of the instructions, so how many instructions there are. And we also, of course, replace uh, those in the last part, which is the last one we are going to uh, optimize or de-optimize, <laughs> make readable. The next step is uh, to turn this ternary expression into an if um, expression or statement. So let's do that. But still, like more readable, but not yet. Like, what is this thing going on? Um, so yeah, not only there, but here. The, the thing we are doing here is by understanding the semantics of JavaScript, if you put a plus in front of, uh, of a value, it's going to coerce it into an integer. And so if it's a string, it's going to do like parsing does, basically. And if, it's, if, it's a, if the string contains a number, it will return the number. But if it's not, it will return none, so not a number. So we, we use the plus here to parse the t into a number. And then we use the double equals and t again. And why would we try to compare a value to itself but before parsing? It's because since the left side now is a number, potentially, the double equals will coerce the second side to a number two. And why are we comparing the number to itself? Shouldn't it be always be equal? Well, in JavaScript, there's a single value that is not equal to itself, which is not a number. And there's an interesting history behind why that's the case in every processor. And 
So what we are checking there is if the thing is equal to itself, then t was actually a string containing a number. And if it's not, then it, it's not. So if, if it was a number, then we enter on this branch. We will see what it does. And we notice that even like doing the, the coercion to integer again, to, to number again, uh, was shorter than any alternative. So let's undo this. Um, so now what we do is we use parseInt with the base 10 to parse uh, t, and we get a number, and we check with number that is uh, finite to check if the, the parse value is actually a number or not. If it's a number, we go on this branch, and if it's not, we go on the next one. The next thing to improve is this uh, magical number plus the index of uh, t in a string. So in uh, what we are doing here is um, we are lucky enough, or we, we happen to know that uh, the arithmetic expressions, uh, operations in WebAssembly, the opcodes for those are one after the other um, in, in the bytecode sequence, uh, except one we don't want to use. So what we do is, we, since we only allow pl plus, minus, uh, multiplication and division, we create a string with, um, with all of them, plus a space, and we look for the index of t uh, into them, and we get the index. So plus is going to be zero, but plus in WebAssembly is 106, and then 107, 108, and 110. So we add the, the base the, of, of the, all the instructions. And we use the space here because we don't want to compile that bytecode, um, and we know that t can never be space because we happen we just split by space over here so t, t can never be a space it's always going to be a symbol that is not a number of course if it's not one of these symbols the compiler will fail in weird ways but um it's okay for for a compiler in a tweet so now what we do is we we create an object that maps from the the arithmetic symbol into the opcode as a number and the next step is remove all these magic numbers, even these ones that are next to the symbol. Uh, this uh, 65, uh, it's pretty magical over there. So what we do now is we give names to all the numbers with the names of the bytecodes in WebAssembly and we use them. So in this part of the code, we have no magic numbers going on. And now we learn that this uh, 65 is height 32 const, which is the bytecode saying like, push the next value in the bytecode stream into the uh, into the stack uh, as uh, i32. So that's what this thing does here. And here we can return an array because we do a flat map. So we are mapping into either values or array of values and at the end we flatten it into a, a, a flat array. So we can basically uh, map into fragments of bytecodes. So we are pushing two bytecodes here. Um, and with this, we managed to get to the final boss of the snippet, which is this array of numbers. And it takes a while to explain, but I will try to do an overview. So the, the array starts with four values that represents the WebAssembly model magic number, uh, zero ASM, which is like uh, a sequence of bytes that represents a um, uh, WebAssembly module. Then the next four bytes are a 32-bit integer encoded um, as little endian that represents the version of WebAssembly, in this case 1.0. Then we get uh, in WebAssembly multiple sections. Here I just split them uh, with comments. The first one is the type section, where we specify the types, uh, and it has the identifier of the section, which is one, then follows by the number of bytes that are used for the section, in this case five, which are these numbers over here. Then we say how many entries are there in this section, one. Then we say that the entry is for a function, 97, uh, that has zero parameters and returns one value and the value of the return type is i32. So, so basically, the function we're compi uh, compiling, uh, our module, uh, takes no arguments because uh, our arithmetic expressions takes no arguments and returns the result of evaluating that expression as an i32. The function section is uh, identified with the number three. Uh, we are going to use two bytes for it. And 
we are going to have a single entry and that entry is a number which is the index of the type section entry uh, so this function we have only one function and that function the type is specified in the entry index 0 of the previous section then we have the export section so basically we, we define the type for a function then we specify the function pointing to a type and then we want to export it so it's uh, available from the outside and the export section is identified by number 7 it uh, takes 5 bytes we have one entry that entry um, is um, the the first part is how many bytes does the export name take one uh, and then the string for the export which is a which is 97 in in bytes in ASCII or UTF-8 and the thing we are exporting as a is a function and you can find this function as the entry index zero in the functions uh, section Finally, we have the code section where we specify the, the body for the function we are exporting. And the section identifier is 10. This section takes uh, four fixed because we have four numbers that we know we are going to meet, plus how many instructions the, the body of the function takes. And this code section has only one entry. And the entry number zero takes uh, two, two fixed uh, numbers because we we need to put them and we know the error is going to be there plus the number of instructions our formula took and uh, this is this zero says that this function has zero uh, local variables then we splice the instructions we compiled above and uh, finally we emit the end instruction which says that uh, we finished the body of that function so if you if you found this interesting and you would like to learn more, then uh, we are writing a book. It's getting finished in the next couple of uh, weeks. Uh, you can learn more on wasmgroundup.com or search for wasmgroundup in Twitter and Blue Sky or Mastodon and you're going to find us there.